Well, good morning, Grace Church family. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? We're gonna worship him together in this place this morning. The Lord's Prayer. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come.
You're a miracle worker. We praise your name. We love you in Jesus' name. Well, welcome to Grace Church, everyone here and joining us online. We're so glad to have you. Go ahead and turn to somebody next to you. Find a familiar face. Find a new face. Introduce yourself. Say hi. If you're watching online, you can uh, tell us where you're watching from on the chat. Good morning, everybody. Hey, before we jump in with a few announcements, we're doing a baby dedication this morning. 
So if you're here this morning and you've got your babies with you, go ahead and start making your way up here. Go ahead and come on up. Come on up. And if you haven't, you know, if you're, if you're just here and you didn't go through our orientation, you're welcome to come up. If your baby's here and you want to come up, we're going to pray over you here in just a moment. Now, make your way up, and we're going to do some announcements as you kind of come up here and get settled. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to welcome everybody that's new. We're visiting. We're so glad that you're here. If you want to get connected, you find out, or you have questions about who we are as a church, you want to find out what we do to get connected, how we do life together in community, you can grab a Connect card. They're in the seat backs in front of you. Go ahead and grab that. Fill it out. You can also put your prayer request on that as well and then drop it off in the offering receptacles as you leave today. If you're watching online, you can text the word connect to the number on the screen. I also know many of you are ready to coming, uh, coming in, ready to give your tithes and offerings. You can find ways to give there on the screen. And you can also give in person at those offering receptacles. I want to give a shout out. Yesterday, we had a Pray for the Lou event. Any of you that were a part of that this morning? We had a, a, a group of about, 50, how many, 50 churches? 55 churches, yeah. 55 churches blanketed some 79 neighborhoods that went all over the St. Louis region and had a prayer walk and a day of worship and prayer. You know, our friend, uh, Kurt Wilson, that leads this Pray for the Lou ministry, just absolutely phenomenal. It was a, a fantastic day. Yeah, it was. Hey, really quick, go ahead and pull out your bulletin. There's one thing I want to highlight that's happening uh, next weekend. Our Grace students are having our spring retreat next Friday night and Saturday, and there's a sign-up code. You can scan that QR code in the bulletin. This is a time where our students can kind of unplug from the world, unplug from daily life, get around people their own age, and pursue Christ. We really believe that uh, Christ moves in power on these specific retreats. And so we want to invite you to bring your student. It's $75 uh, with signups end this week. So we'd love for you to, to come be a part of that. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Hey, let's get the cameras down here. Uh, let's do a Mufasa moment the best you can. I know you can't completely extend the arms, but guys, let's just give the Lord a big hand for all this life up here this morning. Yeah, try to get out a little bit. Hey, if I could have you guys, I'm going to have you just kind of spread out a little bit more because we're going to have some of our leaders and pastors go ahead and make your way up here. We're just going to get around you this morning and pray over you. Yeah, just, just space out just so we can get some people around you. Any pastors or leaders, you know, if you're a leader in any kind of way, come on up here and help us to pray. You know, when we do a baby dedication, you know, we're, we're, we're basically as parents and, and as a church family, we're saying, Lord, we're committing this life to you. We're going to do our part and fostering and leading and mentoring and parenting. And it takes a tribe, right? Vesta, this is Vesta, by the way. She's our pastor over all of our children, min, children's ministry, speaking into parents, speaking into kids. This has got to fill your heart a little bit, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we had parent orientation just um, maybe about a half an hour ago. And we just kind of shared that this is a very important step. This step right here is the first step there is in presenting your child back to the Lord. And we're so great. This is the exciting moment for me because I get to come up here at least twice a year to be a part of this. So that, that's my heart. Um, parents, again, as we said over in orientation, you're not the Savior. He is. He asks that you cover, train, raise, and introduce him, them to him. So this is what we ask of you. And in our church family, we have an amazing church family. Ron always let you guys know you guys are amazing. So most of you join us on Wednesday nights, uh, Thursday nights for prayer. I'm going to ask as you guys continue to pray for the millennials, the Generation Z, right here is Generation Alpha. Those are the ones that I'm covering from zero to 10 years old. So I have some Generation Alpha as well as some Gen Zs, but I'm gonna ask that you add them to your prayer list. Generation Alpha, I know we've been hitting Gen Z for a while now, but please do not forget my babies, Generation Alpha. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Can I get a witness out here that it takes a tribe and we're in this together with these yes, parents? Yes. Come on, somebody. No, we're, we are here to help, to support, to pray, to encourage, to inspire. 
All right, let's pray. Let's just, you know, the best you can, leaders, just get around them. We're going to pray over them and bless them. Vesta, go ahead and lead us. All right. Dear Lord, we just thank you for these families that have come forth. Father God, we ask that you allow your Holy Spirit to just rest upon each and every child, yes, Lord. every mom, every dad, every sibling, Father God. We have generals and, and soldiers before us right now, Father. We know what the world looks like, but we also know what your kingdom looks like. Father, we ask that you just continue to strengthen them as they grow. Lord, we ask that you allow their, their peers, the, of the parents and, and of the children to encourage one another, to build them up, raise them up, train them up in the way that they should go, Father God. We know that the world looks dark right now, but this generation we have before us, Father God, are fighters. They're going to be the soldiers and the generals that we need to move forward in the world, Father God. We ask that your spirit just rest upon them as well as the parents. We ask that you allow everyone to be able to just feel your love and the growth in these babies. Father, we need the covering day in and day out. As we come together, you said we're two or more and gathered in your name. You have a whole congregation here, and we're yeah. coming together praying for these babies right now as well as the parents. Father, we ask that you go before us. You lead and guide us. You lead and guide them all in your darling son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's give them a hand this morning. You guys can go back to your seats. Also know that we have a photo booth out in the atrium. I think a lot of you already know that. But we have a photo booth out there afterwards for families and pictures and all that good stuff. Hey, as they're heading back to their seats, let's say hi again to somebody just so it's not so awkward up here staring at me. Just turn around and give somebody a high five. All right, thank you. Well, good morning again. So glad you're here. It's a good place to be on a Sunday morning. So glad we're having families and babies and life. We will continue to celebrate life at all costs and, and also come around parents. You know, parenting's hard. My goodness, it is not easy. It is a, 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 quite the task, and it takes encouragement and resource and help. And this is one of the, the great advantages and opportunities that we have as a church because we're such a church of multi-generations that's already, you know, been through parenting and even grandparenting. And, and I always say young parents don't make the same mistakes again. Glean and learn and let, you know, older people speak in and be open to understanding and, or open to learning new, new things, and especially when it comes to parenting for the first time. So you're just kind of thrown in with a human life that you're responsible for. You're like, good luck. Help God, help us. There's lots of wisdom in the church for, for you to receive help on that. Okay, well, I want to jump right in. Jesus told us many things that would transpire before his return. Because part of the church and part of the definition of grace, according to Titus, is that we're looking towards the coming of our Lord. And he says, you know, there's going to be things that transpire before I come back. He said that the most amount, now listen to this, the most amount of lawlessness and the most amount of deception of any generation would happen before he returns and it would happen suddenly. That's one of the things that he tells us about as far as knowing the signs and being prepared, not being thrown off. If you're new around here, we typically take this part of the service, not every time, but lots of times just to kind of talk about relevant issues where Jesus says to watch and to pray, to not be thrown off, to be aware. When he says to watch and pray, here's what he means. When he says to watch, particularly around the subject of the increase of lawlessness and the increase of deception, he's saying simply, be informed. Don't be easily tricked. Don't be swayed by the, the latest wind that can blow you. Have discernment. Get your head in the game and do due diligence of looking and thinking critically and biblically. But then he says, but it's not just about watching and being informed and in the know. We actually have to pray. Watch and pray. That's what he said continually. And the reason he says to pray is so that we're, our hearts aren't troubled by what we see. We're not overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and like, oh my gosh, we're all just going to hell in a handbasket. Might as well just give up and go build a bunker somewhere and just, you know, hunker down with canned goods. No. 
We're to pray so that our hearts aren't troubled, so that we can keep his perspective, and that we stay on mission, that we're not fooled or, or coerced by the manipulation of truth, that we stay the course. Well, there's two things from this past week. I think every week we could probably talk about 10, but there's two things from this past week I want to talk about. The first was the release of a video footage relating to the January 6th controversy that happened in our nation's capital in 2021, January 6th, 2021. I'm sure most of us are very aware of this, and we're aware that there's really two battling narratives around that event. Some see it as an attempted at takeover of America by extreme Trump supporters and white supremacists, and others see it as a protest that turned into a riot, but at least in some way, was incited by people planted within the crowd that was trying to invoke a riot for the purpose of political gain. Now, I have two friends that I've been friends with for over 20 years that aren't your, you know, bull hair wearing kind of guys that are godly. One of them's a pastor of a church that happened to be there on that day. And we're 100% witnessing people in the crowd that clearly were only there to incite a riot. My appeal to those that only see this as an insurrection, because that has been the dominating media coverage, that this is an insurrection. Unfortunately, I'm almost certain it's going to go down in the history books of January 6, 2021, as a day of insurrection, even some politicians comparing it even to the Civil War. And my goal, our, 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 our plead is to simply view the videos with an open mind. Could it be? that we live in a day where we're being played and manipulated on a grand scale? Could it be that the fact that the, the majority of our media outlets that covered the, the January 6th trials and everything that we've watched in the last year or so, could it be that the majority of those outlets actually favor one particular political party? That alone should at least allow us to be a bit skeptic. So I would say, number one, let's watch these videos with an open mind and just see what the videos show. Now, this play and manipulation leads me to the second point that happened this week. Our First Lady, Jill Biden, and Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, gave the International Women of Courage Award to a man that identifies as a woman. Now, look at this post from Charlie Kirk. Charlie put this up there, and I, I looked at that, and it's just, it, again, because this is a, a play and a manipulation of truth on steroids. This is, Charlie's post is regarding the celebration of quote-unquote women in the last couple of years. Rachel Levine, a man in his 60s, lived as a man, married with two kids throughout his, all the way up until his 50s, but then shifted to be a woman. He's actually the number two in command over the health of America, U.S. Secretary of Health. Rachel Levine, a man identifying as a woman, was USA Today's Woman of the Year. Leah Thomas a male college swimmer, identifying as a female, was nominated in 2022 for the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. Faye Johnston, this happened this last week, a man identifying as a woman, was Hershey Chocolates International Women's Day honoree. Again, this is clear manipulation of obvious truth that men are men, women are women, boys are boys, and girls are girls. Yet, we have people in pop culture, all over TikTok, all over Instagram, all over the highest, you know, seats of influence in our, our land, including our president and even a Supreme Court judge, committed to manipulating this truth until we either bow to it or until at least any questioning of it is absolutely silenced. That's called a watch and pray moment. That's called watch so that you're not eventually hooked into the narrative. Pray so that our hearts aren't troubled even when the velocity of intensity for any that would dare to challenge that narrative is demonized as a transphobe, a homophobe, a racist, a white supremacist, an Uncle Tom, or whatever kind of adjective we want to put on it. Here's the truth as it relates to the Bible when Jesus is watching pray, and this is what we are seeking to be as a church here at Grace is a community of people that are refusing to budge, 
a group of people that are going to cling to truth and not just to know the truth, but to also be willing to speak the truth so that people can be challenged. So with that in mind today, I want to talk about reaching people with truth. It's the sermon today is reach people. Now, b- before I jump into the actual you know, part of how do we do that and what do the scriptures teach us on how to reach people, I want to make sure that we keep the vision of our church you know, a- ahead of us. It's, it's real important you know, as a family, an individual family or as a church family, that we keep our vision ahead of us. And then a vision without a mission is basically just a fantasy. When we have a vision, we have to have an action plan called a mission statement. How are we going to accomplish that mission? And I want to cover both today. And then really the part of the mission about reaching people. Well, here's our vision. Our vision here at Grace Church is to be a praying church committed to confronting the progressive culture with the truth of God's Word. That's the, 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 the simple statement that we can unpack. I want to unpack that simple statement a little bit more. We aim to be disciples of Jesus while constantly working towards making other disciples. And that's important for us to know this. A disciple of Jesus, by definition, is making other disciples. So if we are to claim that we are a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, a believer of Jesus, those are all synonymous, then we have to be constantly in the business of some way of making other disciples. This is what it means simply to be a praying church. Just the word church itself, that's part of the definition. This is what church is all about. We're not a social club. This is not somewhere where you come and get a pass where you can have access to the facilities and access to various things. Now, there are great benefits being connected to the local church, but that's not the point. Just so we're clear, we are a, 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 a living extension of God's kingdom here on earth. We are here to impact any and every sphere of influence the Lord may put us in. Any sphere of influence. We're to be a living extension of God himself, seeking the the, the lost, saving the lost, and seeking to make disciples. The church, when I think of the church, here's the, the four things that I think of. And each of you will gravitate towards one because of the way you're made, your unique gifting, your unique purpose. The church is a family. We're never to be anything else. We're to be always a family of God of different backgrounds and different economic status, different ages, different sexes. We have male, female. I want to make sure I clarify that. Male and female. We have all kinds of different backgrounds. And here at Grace, we have all kinds of different church backgrounds. I was Catholic for years. I was Lutheran. I was Baptist. I was Assemblies of God. I was Charismatic. I was Pentecostal. We have so many, again, that that creates such a unique opportunity. So we're a family. We're also a hospital where we take care of those that are hurting. We're a school where we train and be equipped. And we're an army where we go to take new ground. We defend the truth and we take new ground. We're actually all the above. Any church should have these mission statements and this similar vision to this with an expression of, of those four things. So that's our vision, again, to be a praying church seeking to combat, you know, this progressive ideology with the truth of God's Word. Okay, Wes, so how do we do that? How do we flesh that out? What's it look like? Well, it's actually found in our name, GRACE. GRACE is also an an acronym, G-R-A-C-E, and that's how we memorize and that's how we know and keep our mission in front of us. And I want to briefly go over this. We, we, use, we typically do this about once a year. We do this in our Discover Grace classes, etc. but we, we need to keep it in, ahead of us. So I'm going to do a, a quick review of what our mission is. The G stands for grow spiritually. That's what the G in grace stands for, that we are committed to grow spiritually. We do this mostly by hearing the Word, praying the Word, talking about the Word with each other, and then most importantly, committing as a family, and we're going to hold each other accountable, to obey the Word. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to, we're going to commit to obey the words of Jesus. Now remember, growing spiritually and growing a relationship with Jesus is the same thing. It's synonymous. So when we're growing spiritually, we're really 
saying that we're growing in our relationship, the vibrancy of our relationship with Jesus. That's what it means to grow spiritually. We focus on our mind and our hearts and growing spiritually. Here's a, a couple of verses that I think of. Luke 24, 32. It's after Jesus was raised from the dead. He's walking and the believers are with him and they have this conversation that probably went over an hour. And after they, they talk with him, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Now, that's not pizza midnight heartburn. That's a, a spiritual heartburn where, you know, some other language we use is on fire for the Lord or passionate in my relationship with God. It just simply means that my spirit inside of me is stirred in faith by the words of Jesus. He says, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Now, in that one verse is the key to growing spiritually. He says, as we open to the scriptures and talk to God. Those two things were never meant to be separated. We don't study the Bible and then have a relationship with the Lord. We use the Bible to build our relationship with God. I always tell people, connect with the author. As you're reading the scriptures, this will transform your Bible study life, by the way. If you will pursue the scriptures more than just entertaining the mind, pursue the scriptures as if you're seeking to encounter or experience the author himself. Almost as if you're searching for him as you read the word. The second one is John 14. He says, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey my commandments. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. So G in grace is to grow spiritually. R, the R represents reach people. Again, this is how we work out that big vision, that, big vision that we have as, a, have as a church. I'm gonna skip this one because this is what the whole back end of the sermon is gonna be on. But R is reach. A is act out our faith. We act out our faith by giving our time, our talents, our skills. Again, the, the, the uniqueness in the way that the Lord made you was there for the purpose of impacting people, some of that purpose. We get on the A-team. You know, you may hear that language around here where we have our A-team. Our A-team is basically anybody who serves in any capacity within the church. And our Discover Grace classes that we offer every single month, there are four classes. Part of those classes is to help us discover how the Lord made us and the unique gifting that I have. Because this is truth, guys, listen. Every single one of you have profound purpose. You are uniquely crafted by God for a very specific purpose that brings Him glory. Well, in our Discover Grace classes, we help you connect with what that purpose is and the unique skills that you have so that you can act out your faith. Get on the A-team and be a blessing to others. And here's the truth of this. Our life will be profoundly more enjoyable if we're intentional about blessing and serving other people. Instead of just using my skills and my uh, gifts and talents and money to just make my life better, I'm gonna use some of that to make others' lives, their other lives better. It, it, there's, a, <laughs> there's, there's a payback. It's called joy and peace and, and a, a, a profound sense of purpose in life. Here's the verses that help us to understand why we act out our faith. Acts 20, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. This is Paul. He says, you should remember the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And then James 2, of course, always reminds us of this. Eric, Meta how many of you enjoyed Eric Metaxas last weekend? <laughs> My goodness, what a breath of fresh air. You know, I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, you know, you never know, you know, because we, we, you know, interact with these guys, bring them in, and, you know, I never had met him, and you don't ever know what kind of guys they're going to be. And I was so, so, so blessed. I mean, he is the real deal. You know, he's, we used to always tell our, our, our ministry when I was in Kansas City, be fat, be fat. And it's, it stands for be flexible, adaptable, and teachable. Don't ever graduate from that. that. That's free this morning. You can have that one. Be flexible, be adaptable, be teachable. You'll go far in life if you'll if you'll hang on to that. And here's Eric, 59 years old. He's, he's at a, 
a, a very a, a place in his life that he's making huge impact and all over the place and he comes in he's flexible he's adaptable he's, he's even teachable he's so it was easy to be around I was just so blessed by him behind the scenes and then of course what he brought to us as a church as well okay he said this in James 2 26 he says just as the body is dead without breath so also faith is dead without good works if we're not actively acting out our faith James is, uh, James is not only will your, your faith not ever grow because there's an element of growth in your spiritual life that'll happen when we're intentional of doing this but you're, 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 you're in danger of just your faith decaying to the point of nothing well that's all A so we have G-R-A C the C represents connect and community we do this mostly in small groups and classes where we have a church this size but it's important not to just kind of come in and out of the church without having a sense of real, genuine family or community within the church. So we have small groups and classes and outreaches that are in smaller numbers so that we can, and here's the, the big purpose of, of them. I mean, I appreciate having a good Bible study and a place where I can ask questions about the Bible. That, that's great. But the main purpose that we do, these small groups and classes, is to help people find each other. We want to have godly friendships. It's, it's, it's critical. Our, our spiritual life actually depends on it. We have to have each other so that we can have uh, the, the opportunity to, to, to share our struggles, to, to be real. You know, I heard a pastor once say so that we could take off the mask that everything's just fine. Everything's not just fine. I got struggles and worries and questions and I go through curveballs and I have accusations against God. God, where were you? What happened? I have sicknesses that all of a sudden come up in my life or my family. We're meant to go through those hard things together. It's, it's critical that we have godly friendships and that we connect with each other. Here, here's a, here's a, a good quote. To the measure that we're willing to be real and honest with each other about our struggles will be the measure of freedom we experience from those struggles. Anybody here with me this morning? This is truth. To the measure we're willing to be honest and real it's to the measure of freedom that we'll experience in the day to day. This is why godly friendships are critical. They're life giving. Don't let our friendships just simply be social where we talk about the sports and weather and what other crazy thing has happened this week. No. I mean, we talk about those because we're humans and that's what we do, but we have to be intentional to go deeper. We have to go a bit deeper than just the surface and talk about fears and, and struggles in our life, anxieties that we're battling through. Here's the way that the, the Bible teaches it. Hebrews 3 it says take care that not that there not be in any one of you an evil unbelieving heart that falls away from God he says take care there's not this isn't happening in any, in any one of you and then he's going to tell us how to keep us from that in the next statement he says but encourage one another daily so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin well, the only way that can happen is if we're in the context of close, godly friendships where we're being real and honest with each other. We can't just, you know, live on the surface level and not let, and not let anybody in. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So that's the C, G-R-A-C. Here's the E. What does the E represent? E represents exalt God and worship and prayer our primary identity as a church and not just the, the bigger group but even us as individuals is to be a people who worship Jesus and pray and now I, I throw another word in there together that we do this together one of the clearest threads from Genesis to Revelation is the wisdom that God reveals when the body of Christ the church comes together to seek the Lord Second Chronicles 7, he says, if my people, now, now Second Chronicles 7 is in the context of chaos in the land, insanity everywhere, and seemingly, uh, you know, losing ground of, of biblical virtue and godliness, and God says this, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he says, if you will do your part, I will do my part. 
I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. Now, it's more than just God saying, I'm going to bless the dirt when you see restore the land. Although I think God blesses agriculture as well. As well. It's, it's, I will restore your cities. I will restore the family unit. I will restore godly virtue in the midst of society. And can I get a witness this morning that we could use a dose of that in America? Well, he says, okay, if you want it, here's the prescription. Humble yourselves. Come together and pray and seek my face and repent. Repent of what? Repent of our lethargy. Repent of our cowardice. Repent of our uh, uh, ways of being, uh, you know, two-faced and saying one thing and living another. We, we repent and say, God, we need you and our family and nation, etc. Isaiah 56 my house should be called a house of prayer. He could have said anything there. He could have said, my house should be called a house of evangelism. My house should be called a house of, of reaching the poor. All good things that, he's, that he calls us to, but he says, but above all, my house or my family, you could put the word family there if you wanted to. My house, my family will be identified mostly as a people who pray and seek my face. And then in Acts 2, verse 1, the, ch the start of the early church, they, they put this in, in place as a model for us to glean from. When the day of Pentecost had come, there they were. This phrase stands out to me. They were all together in one place, seeking the Lord, because the Lord had commanded them to do it in Luke 24. Go and be together and wait upon the Lord together. Let that be a constant thing that you do as it relates to being the church. Now, one way that we exercise that is in our prayer meetings. We have prayer meetings throughout the week, every week, Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, an extended time of worship and prayer. I know here on the weekends, because we have a different purpose for every service, you know, we just barely scratch the itch on worship. We just get a little, just, a, just a little bit. Well, I'm telling you, we have other times throughout the week that we scratch that in a way, you know, longer way. We just keep on scratching that itch. You know, Wednesday nights, we have extended times of worship and Thursday mornings, we get up early and meet in the chapel and pray for our families in our city. We do it again Thursdays at noon. And at the end of May, we have a prayer sprint where we do this three times a year. We take a whole week, Monday through Friday, several prayer meetings a day to do 2 Chronicles 7, to be the Isaiah 56 family that he says that we're to be. So that's E, we exalt God in worship and prayer, G-R-A-C-E. Now, here are the two verses that we use to come up with that mission. The first one is the great commandment, Matthew or, or Mark 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first commandment, the first priority in the life of the church, in the life of the believer. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then we use this passage the Great Commission passage, Matthew 28. Jesus told them, I have been given authority in heaven and, and, and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Be about this, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of the Scripture that I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you, I will help you, I will be upon you to the end of the age. Come on, somebody, I feel like we just had a good church service right there. I love that. I love that our, our mission is easy to remember. It's in our name, G-R-A-C-E. It's a good way to evaluate our Christianity. It's a good way to evaluate our ministry. It's a good way to evaluate our families. You could take that and say, you know what, we're going to do this as a family. Well, I want to back up and I want to talk about the R, reaching people today. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this morning you would convict us as a church with the burden that you have for the lost, that you would stir us up to do our part in reaching people. Help us, convict us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, when we talk about reaching people and evangelism, today I'm gonna to talk about four things that I believe are, are helpful that we can do to kind of stoke the flame. Because if there's a flame that goes out in the church the quickest, it's the fame of outreach, it's the fame of evangelism. And if we will keep these four practices that I wanna talk about today, it'll actually keep the, the fire burning, if you will. 
Okay, now also know this. This isn't a comprehensive list. So you don't have, I can save you the email now to say, well, what about this? I, I say yes and amen to that. I'm just gonna hit uh, four, just four areas that I, I, I think can help us. But here's the important part as I talk about these four things. We all have a role to play. Don't dismiss yourself out of any one of these four because of a personality. Because, man, that guy over there, you know, he's the bullhorn guy down at the blues hockey game on the sidewalk preaching the gospel as people are coming out of the building. Bless you, brother. I, I, I do not have what it takes to do that. And if that's what evangelism is, I'm out. That's part of it. And just because you may not have that personality doesn't mean you don't have a role to play. You have a profound role to play as it relates to reaching people. Here's the first thing I want to challenge us to do. Number one, pray for specific people. Not just generally, but very specifically. And I mostly, I have, I've had this list of three or four people since I was 20 years old. I'm, believe it or not, I'm be 46 next month. I know I don't look it, but just believe that. <laughs> I have had this list. Now, my goal is for that list to constantly change because they're getting born again, which I've had to, you know, swap in a few people here and there. But I want to have three or four people that I am constantly praying very specifically for. Now, in our prayer book, uh, well, you can get them at our information desk. We're out right now because people went and got them in mass, but we've got a big order coming in. It's also online. Our prayer book, we actually have specific praise to help praise, prayers to help you to pray when you're praying for those that need God in a salvation way. You know, what I'm usually praying for is God to convict them of sin. I mean, I get them in my mind. I say their name before the Lord. God, and I always make it today. Lord, convict them of sin today. Let them know they are in profound need of a Savior. Let them know that they're in need because they have a dead spirit and they're dead in their sins. I, I pray for their eyes to be open, their spiritual eyes to be open to the truth of Jesus, that their ears would be opened. I pray, God, tonight in dreams, invade them in their dreams. In their most vulnerable state, give them dreams where you're preaching the gospel to them. Here's another thing I'll pray for, is I'll pray for a godly person to be in their life if it's not me. You know, maybe they live in a different city or maybe I just very rarely have that opportunity to, to, to have, you know, heartfelt conversations with them. But somebody else might. I pray God put a witness in their life. When we pray for people, here's what happens. We catch God's heart for the lost and we catch God's heart for them. We will, we will begin to pursue them different. We will begin to, to uh, uh, interact with them differently when we see them through God's eyes. We must always remember and never forget that God is constantly working to save the lost. And that means the people in your sphere of influence. I mean, think about them right now in your sphere of influence. We all know work, class, school, neighborhoods, we all have that sphere of influence where there's those people. Those people right now, God is, ab he, right now, he is working constantly to bring them to the faith. Luke 19, it says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. John 3, 16, it says that God so loved the world, or you could say God was burdened by the lost of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It, you could easily say that God is distracted by the lost. Luke 15, write that down. Luke 15, Jesus tells us three stories, three parables, to make the point that God is burdened by the lost people in our lives. He wants us to be bothered by it as well. That's the point of the three stories in Luke 15. You know, when we lose something, or even worse, when we lose someone, a kid, we're absolutely consumed until it's found. That's the point of the three parables. And also notice this, we'd like help in the search for that valuable thing that we've lost, and we're annoyed by the inaction of people around us. This is what it means in the Great Commission. The great commission of go and make disciples of all nations. That's, that's us partnering with the Lord in this burden for the lost that he has. Now, there's a, a pastor in, in Alabama by the name of Chris Hodges. 
incredible church, and he's got a video here that makes this point the clearest. He actually makes this point so clear, you'll hear this in our, our Discover Grace classes. Ron tells the story, but I wanted us to hear straight from Chris this morning. Let's watch this. We start off in a coffee shop, and we're just all getting coffees, 20-something of us. About the time the last person got their coffee, Joseph, unbeknownst to anyone, he didn't announce it, decides to go over to the toilet. He wanted to use the restroom, right? And so we don't know he's in there, so when the last person got their coffee, we all leave the coffee shop, we walk down the street, and go into an ice cream store. We were gonna eat our way down the street. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> and and uh, so we're now, all of us, in another store. Joseph comes out, out of the bathroom, doesn't see anybody, goes the opposite direction. When he's missing, all of a sudden I realize, hey guys, where's Joseph? And, and, and to say I freaked out is an understatement. I mean, I, I, when I say I freaked out, I freaked out, freaked out. I said, guys, we got to find him now because he can't handle it. He can't, he wouldn't have been able to even tell who he knows or he just doesn't, he can't do that. Like we had pre-planned it, 20 people went go in 20 different directions. I, I found a security guard um, leaning up against the building. He's got a radio and a gun. He's just sitting there, fo arms folded. And I'm frantic. Sir, 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 you got to help me find my son Joseph. He's, got, he's about 13 years old. He's got reddish blonde hair. He's, he's, he's autistic. You got to help, help. And the guy never unfolded his arms. And he says, well, did you look the last place you saw him? Can I confess my sins at conference, everybody? I'm going to take you out right now, man. Help me out. Help me. You have abilities that you're not helping me with. And I was irritated by his inactivity because something of value was missing to me. There was never a moment while we were looking for Joseph that I thought, I got four others. 80% ain't bad. You know, I never thought that, you know. In fact, I didn't really care about that. You know, the story, I saw Joseph. Um, I'm the one who found him. He was, he was a little fair-skinned face, was blush red from crying so hard. And he was just looking back and forth, just kind of walking pretty fast, just frantically find, trying to find someone he recognized. And I saw him crossing this little stone bridge over a creek in this little snow village. And I yelled, Joseph! And he just, he looked, and he ran as fast as he could toward me, and we embraced. Dad, I've been looking for you everywhere. I said, son, I've been looking for you too. And Pastor John, I became a different kind of a pastor that day. It changed the way I lead a church. It changed the way I, I live my own life. It, ju it just made me clear to know the heart of God is for his kids that are missing. And, and I just know if God had the chance to talk to his church, he would say, would you please, it, it, would you please go into all the world and touch as many lives as you can? And if you will, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the Come on, somebody. You know, Again, that's, that's the point of Luke 15, is to bother us with the burden that God has for the lost. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray specifically for specific people. Keep that hit list, you know, keep that list of three or four that you're seeking to pray for and watch what God does in our hearts as it relates to our burden for the lost. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to excel in showing honor and kindness we're going to be excellent at this. This is going to make massive impact, again, in our sphere of influence. In influence. Man, my words are all kinds of jittery this morning. We're going to earn people's ear when we consistently show them respect and that we're good and respectable people. I want to say that again. We earn people's ear. Man, if you want to have a, a heartfelt conversation with somebody where you want to talk to them about the subject of eternity, the realities of sin, earn their ear. Well, here's how you earn their ear. We earn their ear by consistently showing them respect and kindness and that we are good and respectable and trustworthy people. When we show them that, you would be amazed of the amount of people that will show up at your door because they want to talk about a struggle in their life. And just know, just know, that's the Lord been preparing them for this moment and preparing you for that moment to actually have a conversation that could probably have eternal consequences where their life's going to be changed. This is mostly played out in our sphere of influence. Again, we mostly think of people out there, but it's the people right where God has put us in our family, our neighborhood, our work, our school. I got to brag on my wife. My wife is absolutely awesome at this. She has led our family for years in being a person that shows love and kindness and respect to people in a way 
that people are drawn to her. You know, I remember when we were in Kansas City, she worked, or she's worked, she worked as a critical care nurse for 20 years in ICU and different, you know, floors of the hospital. When we were in Kansas City, you know, one of the, the first places she worked, it wasn't the, the most sanctified, godly place, that little nursing unit. God bless them. I was like, get out of there, you know, and she'd come home with some of the stories of just people that lived a very different lifestyle and godlessness. It was night shift, and she had people that just believed differently, and they had no kind of Christian grid. But I'll tell you what happened over the years that Amanda worked there is people that believed and lived very different than her. She would find one after the other of coming to her when there was either accusations against the church that they were like, you know, I hear these accusations against the church, but then I meet you, and your husband's a pastor, and you're different. That's because we should earn people's ear by the fact that we are good, respectable people over time, and we've proven our godliness over time. I, you know, in all the neighborhoods that we lived in, Amanda takes that good virtue, and then she spreads it to our, our neighborhoods of always, always, sometimes at my cost, because I am not so much this. We've got to have big parties and outreaches, invite everybody and all these people, and and I'm over there just like, can they leave yet, please? And, and she's over there challenging me and our other neighbors of everybody's got to know everybody. And, and then it just, it just eases out of her, showing love and respect to people. And I'll tell you what happens over time when we do that. Again, it earns people's ears. And when all of a sudden a crisis comes up, all of a sudden this comes up, I'll tell you who they're going to go to. They're going to go to people that have earned their trust and that's a golden opportunity for us to share the truth. And believe it or not, you know, this is the truth. For many years when Amanda was a nurse, that was her pulpit. She never taught Sunday school class. She was never, hardly ever up here with me preaching and teaching because that wasn't her calling. Her calling at that time of her life, because she's in other areas now, but in that time of her life, that nursing station and the patients that she ministered to, that was her pulpit. We have to see whether we're a student, whether we're at work, whether we're in our neighborhood, God has all kinds of variations of our pulpits. We are all missionaries, not just those supported on a church organi you know, organizational chart. We are the body of Christ equipped with the Spirit of God to be the influence of God wherever he may put us. So excel in showing honor and kindness. Here's what it says in Proverbs 3. It says, let not kindness and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem, not only in the sight of God, because God is honored, but look, it says, also in the sight of man. Proverbs 3. 1 Peter 2, I love this. It is God's will. If you ever wanted to know what God's will is for your life, here it is. It is God's will that your honorable lives, that simply means that you show honor and respect to people in front of others and behind closed doors, the way you treat them and the way we talk. Your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. And you know, we're actually living in the day and age where this is increasing and increasing, where Ron can all of a sudden be called a white supremacist and a racist. Where some of us can be called a homophobe because we disagree with the narrative on sexuality. Where we can be called a transphobe, a hater, all of these very evil words. But then, people that have known us intimately, and I'm not talking within the church, I'm talking family and friends and coworkers and classmates, They've watched you for years, and they're like, man, I'm conflicted because I hear these accusations against you, but I've known you for several years, and you've been the polar opposite of these accusations. That's what Peter is saying. Church, that is to be our witness. Here's the statement. Our virtue should always be as loud as our mouths. Take that one to the bank. You can cash it today. Our virtue should always be as loud as our mouths. Now, it's not only our virtue... We're going to talk here in a second that we have to know the truth and be willing to speak the truth. But our virtue gives us the authority in people's lives to speak about weighty matters of sin and eternity. Number three, be available. So the first, pray. The second, excel in showing honor and kindness. The third one, be available. Most people will come into salvation by those that are around us in a more intimate way. 
We have to be available when those opportunities of conversation come up. Here's a phrase that has been said around here for decades. I love this phrase. There's someone in your life who's one ask away from a life-changing encounter with God's Son, Jesus. And remember that the Lord is constantly working in every one of your lives and those people around you to bring them to the faith. Here's what we can do. We can invite them to church. We have Easter coming up here in just a little bit. It's the one, the one of a couple times when people that wouldn't dare step foot in a church are usually open. We should pack this place out that weekend on Easter weekend. Pack it out. But not just on Easter weekend. Invite them to church. And here's another thing you can do. And invite them to a baptism. I'm telling you, there are fewer things that will ignite the fire for evangelism in the church when, we've, when we watch and, and witness baptisms and then taking an unbeliever just to be a part of it. You know, when families and friends are invited to a baptism because it provokes so many questions. Like, why in the world are they going in the water again? What does this symbolize? What happened? What is the life change? How many of you have seen Jesus' revolution? Okay, that means a lot of you need to. Jesus' revolution is a great opportunity to invite a lost friend that doesn't know what it means to be a Christian. I'm telling you, the movie is so evangelistic in a light of fire underneath you. John 20, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us to be reconciled to God. Acts 1.8, I will give you power and you will be a witness unto me in any sphere that I put you in. And I love how Ron says this. Here's a quote from Ron. He says, don't miss the Holy Spirit setups by living a distracted life and not looking for those God opportunities. He says, it's actually more about our availability than our ability. Because some of us will just, you know, we'll write ourselves off that we don't know what to talk about the clearest. And I got to tell you, number one, if you've earned somebody's ear, trust the Lord in those moments and your own personal story of why you believe what you believe will be the most impactful. Not your eloquent way of going through all of the doctrinal truths of salvation. I didn't even get saved that way. I figured all that out later. It was just simply someone there that I could pour my heart out to and somebody at least make a little bit of sense out of it. Like, yeah, repent of your sin. Yeah, his name is Jesus. I mean, it was about that much clarity for me. And then I worked it out over time. Okay, here's the fourth one. This is important. The fourth one is to know the truth. We're no longer living in an America that is saturated with clear biblical truth. Many are either unchurched or they're, they, they've heard a false gospel that doesn't even emphasize sin or the need for repentance or the need for God. There's not an emphasis, uh, you know, an emphasis on our new identity in Christ where the old man has to be renounced and put away. Some have been introduced into the, 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 the grace or into the, the faith and into the church with baptism and everything without any clear teaching on that. It's a false gospel. We, we can't even say, I go to church anymore, and that means the same thing. I'm a pastor. I can't even, you know, introduce myself as, as a pastor to some people, and that means the same thing. We have so many pastors here in our own city that preach a very different gospel than what we preach. And that's just where we're at in America. Now that's sad, but I want you to hear this church. It's also an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity. Because what happens when it gets real dark outside? The light gets lighter. When you're in a dark field and can hardly see the hand in front of you and somebody lights a fire, you can see it from miles away. The light gets, come on, somebody, I like that. When the, the light gets so incredibly bright, it's easier to see. So that's the opportunity that we live in. Isaiah 60, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness all the people. But the Lord will arise over you. His glory, which is speaking of the light of God, will be seen upon you. This could be our finest hour. Now, I want to uh, talk to us and end with this on these confrontational truths that we have right now in our culture that we're being willing to address here at church. Don't be afraid of these confrontational truths of Scripture as it relates to cultural conversations. Subjects like gender and sexuality, they can actually lead to great opportunities of seeing people set free and saved. 
It's okay to be uncomfortable in these conversations. It's normal. These are very sensitive and deep conversations. It's okay for you to be uncomfortable, and it's also okay to make somebody else uncomfortable. You know, I look back on my salvation experience when I was given over to perversion and lies and being a hypocrite and lost as all get out. And I'm grateful for the people that were willing to make me uncomfortable with talking about weightier issues of life and helping me to work through some of those things. These are sensitive and weighty, but don't let the fear of not being liked get in the way of sharing the truth. Don't let that happen. Commit to truth and trust that God is working in these relationships that you're going to be having these weightier conversations with. Because the truth will set people free. And I believe what we're, what's happening right now is we're being tested as the church on whether or not we really believe that. Do we believe the truth is actually just too confrontational? Ah, water it down a little bit. That, that's too offensive. Or is the truth such glaring light that it snatches people out of darkness? I believe the latter. Here's the truth about the topics of our day. We'll never find lasting peace when our primary identity is in our sexual identity, when it's in our gender identity, or even when it's in our racial identity. We'll never find peace when that is our primary identity. When those are our primary identities, we'll be deceived and we'll be easily swayed by the latest or the loudest argument. World, as it relates to the pop culture, as it relates to politics and people of great influence, the world is screaming right now to trust them and their wisdom in this identity narrative. They say, follow what makes us happy and embrace ourselves instead of the guidance of Scripture to deny ourselves like Jesus teaches. Even many churches, like I said before, have confused this. Don't, let's not forget the, the narrow path. It is unloving to make the narrow path broad. It's the most unloving thing you can do, all in the name of quote-unquote loving people. It's actually very unloving to people. It's to make the, the road that leads to life when Jesus says it's narrow and very difficult on the flesh, which means you have to renounce and deny yourself when we make it broad and wide. He says, you're leading people to destruction. And I would say this to anyone struggling with homosexuality, with same-sex attraction, or even gender confusion. These are the words that can have weight on them if your ears are willing to listen and, and be open. Trust what Jesus says about gender. Trust what Jesus says about sexuality and the boundaries of his ways. The, 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 the testimony of Scripture and the believers in him is that Jesus is good. He's not bad. His intentions for you in leading you down this narrow path of renouncing self and self-denial is unto your good and happiness, not unto you being void of peace. It's actually to lead you to peace. He knows best about identity. He is the creator of everyone. He will define you. His boundaries around gender and sexuality, they're crystal clear in the scripture and they're good. They're not bad. They don't rob us of joy. They lead us to it. And I wanna say this, we have a team here and some of our team even, even, even you know, is going down the same journey of the struggles in their life around gender dysphoria or around same-sex attraction. We have a team that will walk with you and talk with you and, and, and be willing to, uh, you know, pray with you and, and go through the, that, that hardship of life with you. I want to encourage you. You can reach out. You can email. You can call the office. You can connect with us in any way you'd like to. I, m but my plead with you is to have ears that hear. In other words, be willing to listen. Be willing to lean in and not let the narrative of the world define you because it will lead to destruction. Now, as it relates to knowing the truth, back to reaching people in our job of this fourth thing of knowing the truth, here's what Peter says. Have the worship team come and join me. First Peter 3, he says, always be ready. Always be ready. You have to always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks on why you live the way you live. Why do you have the hope that you have? Why do you have the worldview the way that you have? Be ready to articulate the truth. Now, the way that we've done that here at Grace to help us 
is we've articulated the gospel in six very simple sentences. And we have it on our website. We have cards you can get at the information desk because this is part of what we have to do to reach people. We have to make ourselves ready. We have to pray for people specifically. We have to be intentional, be excellent at showing kindness and respect. We have to make ourselves available and we have to take the time to know what we're talking about. And those six sentences of the gospel, you can get them anywhere. They're, they're very easy and simple. And here's what I've learned over the years. It's not so much your eloquent way of sharing those truths. It's the truths themselves. Trust the power of the words that are in the gospel. Not your ability to be cool and sound like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's the power is in the words. The power is in the truth of it. And we have to disconnect sometimes our, our kind of clumsiness of sharing it. And, and I would again say, actually, the power of it is when you take those six sentences and you put your story in it, because that's what's so much more powerful. I'll tell you another resource that we have is in February on Wednesday night, I did four messages on what it means to be saved and just straight up answered the questions. I would really encourage you to go and get that resource and look at it over and over and get those verses it's part of how we are ready to reach people. Stand with me, if you will, this morning. We're going to respond to the Lord. The Lord's going to help us in this. We're going to take this song and say, God, here I am. Because all of us have a role to play. All of us have a sphere of influence that he's putting people strategically in your path so that you can partner with him in reaching the lost. So Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we ask you to help us. Come Holy Spirit, burden us with the lost. And Lord, I ask you to stir us up in holy faith to reach people. Let's sing this together. Here I am, Lord. I'll provide the sacrifice. We will offer ourselves to partner with you. You provide the spirit. Help us by giving us your spirit in your heart. And I will open up inside. I will make myself available. You provide the fire. I am going to be excellent showing people honor and respect. I'll provide the sacrifice. And you provide the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Stir in my heart this morning. And I will open up inside. You provide the fire. Come on, let's just sing this as a prayer to the Lord. This is the way we're responding to God. I'll provide the sacrifice. Lord, I will do my part. You provide the Spirit. And I will open up inside. You provide the fire. provide the sacrifice you provide the spirit and I will open up inside fill me up God fill me come on all together let's sing this together before the Lord fill me up. Lord fill us fill with boldness and confidence Fill us with the burden for the lost. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to be a tool in your hand. Lord, fill me up with your Holy Spirit. Anoint me, strengthen me, help me. Lord. He 
come and anoint us, oh God. Come and strengthen us to be a witness. Let your love touch everyone in my life. Let me see people the way you see people. Stir in me a faith. Yes, Lord. I'm going to invite the prayer team down, if you will, this morning. As we come to a close this morning, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want you to think of two or three people in your life that you know need salvation. Whether they're in your workplace or at home, in your neighborhood or school, just get them in your mind. Lord, we bring these individuals before you right now in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, God, for salvation in their life. We pray for the overwhelming conviction of sin in their life. Lord, we pray that their eyes would be open to the truth of Jesus. We pray that you would visit them tonight in their dreams and that a godly witness would be in their life. Save them, O oh God, in Jesus' name. God's people said amen and amen. If you're here this morning and you have questions about Jesus or church or what it means to be a Christian, let our team engage with you, talk with you. You can text the word commit online and we'll have a conversation with you. If you're in need of prayer, for healing, for salvation, for just a broken relationship or boldness to share your faith, let our prayer team pray with you this morning. Also, young adults, kind of that 18 to 25 range, upstairs in the upper atrium, we're having a connect right now, right after church, got some food up there, a chance to meet some people that are like-minded like you and maybe gain some new friends, invite you to come up there and join us for that. God bless you, Grace Church. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. God bless you. Hi, everybody. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us online today for our service. And I just hope that it was challenging and it was provoking and edifying as you continue to seek the Lord in your own personal journey. And so I just want to take a moment and pray for you. Uh, Lord, I just ask that you would just rest upon each one of these individuals that have tuned into our service today, that you would touch them and their families and that you would just even meet them in their, in their time of need, whatever that might be, that you would just bless them in that area and that you would continue to make yourself known to, the, to them in a, uh, just a very profound way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen and amen. Thank you and blessings.